upheavals that will take place before the Day of Judgment. And then towards the middle part of the surah, he tells us three reasons. Allah tells us three reasons why people disbelieve on the Day of Judgment. What are those three reasons? Number one is because we lack self-accountability. We don't take ourselves to account. There's no one does, does, there's no one amongst us except that we fail in this. We don't take ourselves to account. Is there anyone amongst us, ya ikhwati, ask yourself this question, that we go back to sleep, before going back to sleep, we think about everything that we did that day. All the, all the good that we did and we thank Allah for it. All the bad that we did and we seek repentance from it. Is there anyone who does this self-accounting every day? I remember this brother, a friend of mine, he created this Excel tab, Excel spreadsheet about your salah. And how many salahs you did, how many salahs you were late, how many salahs you were on time, how many were prayed in the masjid, how many were not prayed in the congregation, etc, etc. And then at the end it gave you a summary, like a 96%, 48%, this and that, etc. Shocking! If you do that for yourself, you'll be shocked to see the reality of your own actions. Because your own self-muhasaba is lacking in ikhwati. This is number one, lack of self-accountability. Self number two is because we are in a hurry all the time. We are far too much in a hurry. Everything has to be done now. Oh Allah, remove this evil from us right now. Oh Allah, give me good right now. Yeah? The answer has to come from Allah right now. We are a people who are musta'jileen. We are very much in a hurry. Whatever good we want, we want it right away. Whatever evil we want removed, we want it removed right away. Whatever we want, we want it done right away. Far too much in a hurry. We are unable to have patience. And this is problem number two, why we forget the Day of Judgment. It's because we are in a hurry, we forget about the long-term consequences. We only think about the short-term consequences of something. The short-term consequences of something is whatever good or evil that will come right after a deed. But we forget the long-term consequences of every action or long-term consequences of every request that we make from Allah Azza And this is why, this is why the dunya is called dunya because it comes from the word dana, which means to come close. Dana means udnu minni, come close to me, udnu minni, come close to me. That's why dunya is called dunya because it's close to you. But the akhira is called akhir, it's called akhira because it comes from the word akhir, which means next, next station, in the future, past. In, in the future, distant future. And that is why, Yekhwati, we think about it last. And we tend not to have it on the forefront of our mind. The third reason, Yekhwati, that Surah Qiyamah tells us why we forget about the Day of Judgment is because we forget about death. We forget about the moment we will die. We forget about the people who have passed away. Everyone we know in our lives. There's no one here except I'm sure you've seen a dead person. You've definitely seen a dead person. Most of us have also already gone to a grave. How many of us have actually been inside a grave? Al Hassan al Basri, rahimahullah, it was reported that he had a secret room in his house and no one knew what was in that room. He used to go into that room frequently. His wife didn't know what it was. When they passed away, when he passed away, they went into that room and they found it was a very, very tiny room. Okay? The room was nearly the size of this mihrab, only a small room. It was like a room that we have underneath the staircase, as you know. It's a very small, tiny room. What was it? When they went into it, they found it was actually a room with a grave dug in it. There was a grave that was dug in it. The earth was dug up. It was like a grave. And what he would do is that he would go into that grave periodically, regularly, almost every day. And he would remind himself of the moment that he would have to go to the grave. And then he would scream out to Allah, Oh Allah! Oh Allah, send me back so that I may do good from, from what I uh, have left uh, or have yet to do. My brothers and sisters of Islam, Wallahi, going into a grave, inside a grave, is a life-changing experience. I have experienced it myself. I was doing a series, a TV series for a TV channel called Islam Channel in UK. And it was a 12... 12 episode program, it's on YouTube, it's also on Google Video, you can just type in there Journey to the Hereafter Tawfiq Chaudhary, you'll find my series there. In the third or fourth series, I remember it was about death, we were talking about death. And when we came to the topic of death, I went to a Muslim graveyard in UK, and I went to the Muslim graveyard, and I went to a fresh grave that was dug. 
and, the, and typically what the people do in the graveyard is that they dug two or three graves every day expecting that people will be dying that day and we don't know who this, those graves are for but they dig new fresh graves because of the wetness of the earth they have to let it dry for a little bit so what I did was I said okay you know what I'm going to do something I've never done before let me go inside the grave I went inside the grave did the recording etc and then I told them to put the cover on top Wallahi, I couldn't last more than two minutes not even two minutes and I my heart was pounding my you don't understand everything changed for me at that point everything changed for me because Wallahi akhwati, the grave is not two stories tall like we buy homes today it is only two meters high not even it isn't the nice and soft bed that you have that you're accustomed to it is a hard it is a hard wet cold earth that you're going back to there are no beautiful sounds in there of your children laughing and your wife singing to you no nothing like that it is nothing but you and your heart pumping away Ya ikhwati, I remember the statement of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and said, Ya Rasulullah, are we going to have our intelligence and our logic and our mind in the grave? Ya Rasulullah, are we going to have our intelligence and our logic? Meaning just like we can think now, and we can think about the good and bad of what we have done and we can think about the past and present, right? Are we going to have the same presence of our mind inside the grave? And so at that point, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, yes, you will. In your grave, there is no one who enters his grave except that he will have his total presence of logic and mind in his grave. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, don't fool yourselves. Stop being stupid. Yeah, you know what stupid is? Stupid is a medical term. Stupid is a medical term. It wasn't actually a root term before. Stupidity is an IQ of less than 70. This is what stupidity is. Unfortunately, we behave with that which is the most certain thing with a level of stupidity. What we should do is to, is to behave with the thing which we are most certain of with a high level of certainty. And my brothers and sisters in Islam, I'm telling you, I'm a medical doctor, I'm an emergency specialist. I deal with emergency cases. I don't deal with heart attacks. I don't deal with heart patients after they've been fixed. I don't deal with surgeries after they've been fixed. I deal with them as soon as they come into the hospital. They're about to die. I've got five minutes to save them. The brain will die unless, unless with Allah's help, I save them in five minutes. Literally five minutes. I battle with death every day. I see people with their arms blown off. I see people with their heads blown off, their eyes popping out of their sockets. I see little babies dying. I see, you know, people crying. Ya ikhwati, my brothers and sisters in Islam, there's nothing like death to wake you up to the reality of where we are all headed. Nothing like the reality of death. So one of the worst things we do today is that we spend our time going to the malls. And, the, and one of the best things we should be doing is that we should be going to the graveyard at least once a week. Reminding ourselves of the grave, the equity. And it's a shame that we don't do so. My sincere advice is to remember and remind yourselves of death. The Prophet Sallallahu said in authentic hadith in Bukhari, he said, Akfiru min dhikri al-hadim al-ladhat al-mawt. Akfiru min dhikri hadim al-ladhat al-mawt. Remind yourselves again and again, continuously, of the destroyer of pleasures. What is the destroyer of pleasures? Death. Destroyer of pleasures, ya ikhwati. Destroys all pleasure. My brothers and sisters in Islam, these are the three reasons why we disbelieve in the Day of Judgment. We don't take ourselves to account, even though we should be. And if we did, we would know the reality of our situation. We don't, and we are too much in a hurry. Everything has to be right now. And number three, we forget death. These are the three reasons why we forget the Day of Judgment, or we disbelieve in the Day of Judgment, or we are not firm and certain about the Day of Judgment. This is Surah Qiyamah. One of the most eloquent surahs in the Quran, if you were to read it in the depths of the night, you would be filled with so much fear of Allah and so much realization of the reality that we are all heading for. Ya ikhwati, everything you do in this dunya, you will do the opposite in the akhirah. If you laugh a lot in this dunya, you will cry a lot in the akhirah, I promise you. And that is what our ulema used to say. The ulema used to say, if you spend a lot of time in this dunya in playful jest and laughter, 
you will spend the Akhirah a lot of crying and disaster. You will, ya khuti. So let's spend this, this time in, our, in, in this dunya, crying over the hereafter as well. And if you cannot cry, as the ulama used to say, if you cannot cry, then make yourself cry. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use your witness of your tears to give you his shade on the Day of Judgment. The Prophet ﷺ said, seven people are the ones who Allah will shade on the Day of Judgment. One of them will be a person who remembers Allah in secret and his eyes water with tears. Ya ikhwati, let's take Surah Qiyamah and learn about the Day of Judgment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised, which is going to come true for all of us. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, the one who is Ar-Rahman, the one who is most merciful to all creation, Ar-Rahim, the one who is merciful specifically to the believers. La uqsimu bi yawm al-qiyamah. La means what? In the Arabic language, la means no. So why is Allah saying no? I don't swear by the day of judgment. It is a special way in the in Islam in, in, in Arabic language called balagha or or Arabic poetry to say la to mean of a surety most definitely I do it's a bit like in, in the English language when you say no I don't I'm not hungry of course I'm hungry you know what I'm saying no no I'm, I don't love you of course I love you you know in that way yeah so in, it's, it's a bit like that it's like saying almost no but what you actually mean is of a surety you do yeah so la uqsimu bi yawm al qiyamah I don't swear by the day of judgment meaning of a surety I swear by the day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the great king, he swears by the day of judgment when he will judge all of mankind. La uqsimu bi yawm al-qiyamah. Yawm al-qiyamah has 27 names in the Quran. 27 names Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to yawm al-qiyamah. Can you tell me some of the names that you know of? Yawm al-qiyamah is one. Yawm al-taghabun. Yawm al-tanad. Yawm al-deen. Al-Haqqa, Al-Sakha, right? Yawm uh, Al-Mi'ad, Yawm Al-Hisab, right? So many, subhanAllah, so many. I could go on and on. So many names of the Day of Judgment. Ya khuti, why does the Day of Judgment have so many names? Because it is the Sunnah of the Arabs of the past that when something was important, they gave more names to it. When something is more important, they had more names. So therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the most important thing of all, He doesn't have only 100 names. No, this is a mistake. He has 100 that He told us. He has many, many more He hasn't told us about. He will tell us about on the Day of Judgment. Or He will tell us about in Jannah, inshaAllah. But not only 100 names, He has more than that. 100, He has told us so that we might memorize it and so that we may enter Jannah through it. Just like I'm saying that I have $100 in my pocket for charity. That doesn't mean I only have a hundred dollars. It means a hundred is for charity. I might have two hundred in my pocket. Does that make sense? Hundred is for charity, another one hundred for myself, for example. Okay. So don't misunderstand the hadith of Rasulullah that says, Lillahi tis'a isman, mi'atan illa wahid, man ahsaha dakhla al-jannah. Don't misunderstand the hadith. That Allah has 99 names, 100 except one. Whoever memorizes and enters, enters jannah, this means that Allah has a hundred names that He told us about, which if we memorize it, we can enter Jannah through. Not that He only has a hundred names. Okay. In the same way, Yawm al Qiyamah has many more names as well. Not only 27 names, but these are the names Allah has told us about. We know the Arabs, for example, have 1,000 names for the sword. So a sword in Arabic has 1,000 names. A horse in Arabic has 2,000 names. A camel in Arabic has 3,000 names. 3,000 names for a camel in Arabic, Allahu Akbar. So as you can see, when the Arabs put something more important to something, they give it more names. So what do you reckon is more important to them? Camels, right? Yeah, because they have more names for the camel. Right. لا أقسم بيوم القيامة I swear by the day of judgment. ولا أقسم بالنفس اللوامة I don't swear, meaning of a surety I swear by نفس اللوامة. What is the نفس اللوامة? The Quran tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created three types of nafs. The nafs which is the soul that we have, Allah has created three different types of souls. The first and the highest level are the souls of the anbiya, the souls of the highest of the ulema of Islam. 
and this is the soul of the greatest of the beings, the greatest of creation, like the soul of Jibreel. Jibreel has a soul, Shaitan has a soul, the Hurul Ain have a soul. Everything that is living has a soul. Anything that does not live does not have a soul. So in Islam, for example, we don't consider trees to have life. Though of course trees do have life, biological life, but no spiritual life. Okay? So it does not have a soul. So anything that does not have a spiritual life does not have a soul in, 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 in Islam. طيب? So the soul of Jibreel, the soul of Rasulullah, the soul of the highest of the prophets of God, best of the scholars of Islam, they are the souls of the, of the first type, which is called an nafsul mutma'inna, or the soul that is most at peace or content with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is called nafsul mutma'inna. Then comes nafsul ammaratum, nafsul lawama, which is the second type of soul. Nafsul lawama. What is the nafsul lawama, the second type? This is the self reproaching soul, the soul that does wrong but then takes itself, itself to account. You know, for example, it delays the salah, they say, Audhu Billah, how did I do that? Audhu Billah, Ya Rabbi, I'm never going to do that again. I'm going to be firm. Astaghfirullah, I did that sin. Astaghfirullah, Tawbah, Tawbah. Ya Rabbi, forgive me. Okay, the soul that reproaches itself, the self-reproaching soul. This is called Nafs al-Lawwama. This is the second type of soul that Allah, Allah uh, promises by. This is the soul of all of us here. If they are amongst us, nafs al inna glory be to Allah, you are from the highest of human beings. But the vast majority of us have this nafs al nafs al lawama, which is a self reproaching soul. We sin and then we repent. We sin and then we repent. And then the last type of soul, the third type, is called nafs al ammaratun bisu. A nafs al ammara bisu, the soul that is completely full of sin, engrossed in sin. And these are the souls of disbelievers or the souls of the worst of Muslimin, the ones who are completely engrossed in sin. Tayyip. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by a nafs al lawama. He swears by the second type of soul. Wala uqusimu bin nafs al lawama. Why? Because this is the soul that has the best chance other than the nafs al mutma'inna to succeed on the day of judgment. Does mankind think that we will not be able to gather his bones together? Does mankind think we will not be able to put his bones together? Subhanallah. Bala of a surety. Of course we're able to. Bala qadirin. Meaning I am able to. I have total ability. Ala an nusawiya banana even to put him back to the tip of his fingers. Look at the miracle of the Quran. At that time, the Sahaba never knew that the tip of our fingers are special to each one of us. They never knew about fingerprints and how fingerprints are unique. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I am able to put you back to the tip of your fingers, O human beings. Imagine how powerful is Allah. How amazing. And by the way, all he has to say is, Kun fayakun. All he has to say is be and we will be. It's amazing wallahi. The power of Allah is unbelievable. The power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unbelievable. Unmatched. So much so that he will put us back to the tip of our fingers. Right to the tip of our uncircumcised bodies. Allah will put us back. This is the way Allah will put us back subhanallah. Bala qadirina ala an musawiya banana. I don't know about you, but wallahi, when I read this, I am filled with so much iman about the power of Allah Zawajal, and so much thiqa and trust about the strength of Allah Zawajal. Wallahi, if Muslimin did not exist in this dunya, there would be no one else who worshipped Allah in the right way. Because only Muslimin worship Allah and give Allah his haqq. Because look at how we describe our God. Someone who has total ability. Whereas every other religion, from Jews to Christians to everyone else, describes Allah with deficiency. He created the heavens and the earth on six days, on the seventh day he rested. Musibah, yani. Musibah, isn't it? How can you even think about that about Allah? Bala qadirina ala an nusawiya banana. We can put everyone back to the tip of his fingers. Bal yuridul insanu liyaftura amama. So, how is it, O mankind, that you wish to? Sin in front of me. Bal yuridul insanu. Mankind wishes 
liyafjura amama to sin in front of me. Ya salam. This is a verse that should put shame in front of all human beings. That we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees everything, knows everything, can see everything, yet we tend to sin in front of Ar-Rahman, not fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bal yuridul insanu liyafjura amama. Mankind wishes to sin in front of him. Knowing that Allah is in front of you, we still sin in front of him. Yas'alu ayyana yawmul qiyamah. So in arrogance and haughtiness and pride, he asks, Ayyana yawmul qiyamah. When will the day of judgment be? Meaning that they wish not to believe, and so in their disbelief, they make this arrogant statement. Tell us when will it be if it's true. Just because I'm unable to tell you when it will be doesn't mean that the story of the Day of Judgment is not true. Because Allah is hidden when the Day of Judgment will be. But that does not mean therefore that the story of the Day of Judgment itself is untrue. It's not. It is always true. يَسْأَلُوا أَيَّانَ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ So Allah tells you when it will be by its signs. He says, فَإِذَا بَرِقَ الْبَصَرِ What does barik mean? بَرَقَ الْبَعِيرِ we say in Arabic, Barak al Ba'ir means when the Ba'ir, which is one of the nouns for camel, when it runs off. So you remember when, the, when you hit the back of the camel, right? And the camel starts jolting all the way, running very, very fast, because you hit the back of the camel, the camel starts moving away. Imagine if you're on top of the camel, what would happen? Have you seen a camel race, anyone? If you've seen a camel race, you would see the guy on top of the camel, he's bouncing all the time. Have you seen? He's not like the horse, like, you know, like uh, who's having a nice steady run. No. The camel, you're just jumping all the time. You Okay. فَإِذَا بَرِقَ basar means, imagine you're top of the camel. What would your eyesight be? You'd be all shaking. Like this. That's right. So what Allah says, فَإِذَا بَرِقَ basar means, when the eyesight is dazed and hazy and shaking. Why? Because your bodies are erupting and shaking from the tremendous earthquake of that day. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Imagine how fast your body is shaking, your eyesight is completely dazed. فَإِذَا بَرِقَ الْبَصَرِ وَخَسَفَ الْقَمَرِ And when the qamar, which is the moon, has an eclipse. Khasif means it eclipsed. Right? So khusuf al-qamar means the eclipse of the qamar. Why will there be an eclipse? Because totally the sun will run out of, of light. There will be no more light. So therefore the total eclipse that will happen this is the final eclipse, right? No more light at all. That will happen when, when sun has run out of light totally. وَخَسَفَ الْقَمَرِ وَجُمِعَ الشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرِ And the sun and the moon have come together. Meaning the sun has expanded so much that it has mixed in with the moon. And this is how big the sun will expand towards the day of judgment. It will actually come together with the moon. Until there is no more sun and the moon, there is only one body now. وَجُمِعَ الشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرُ يَقُولُ الْإِنسَانُ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ أَيْنَ الْمَفَرُ On that day, mankind will scream out and say, أَيْنَ الْمَفَرُ Where is the escape? Where shall we escape? You know, when an earthquake happens, every one of us starts thinking, where shall we escape? The first thing on our mind is what? Where shall we hide? Correct? Some of us will hide under the, under the table. Others will want to run out. Some of us will stay near a pillar. Others will want to look up to see where it's falling and then go away. Yet others will try and, you know, run into the rooms. Where is escape from Allah on that day? Kalla, no escape. La wazar, no escape at all. No escape. Ila rabbika yawma idhinil mustaqar. On that day, the return is back to Allah. Ila rabbika, to your Lord is mustaqar. Mustaqar means the place of rest. Not rest meaning where we will rest, but rest meaning where the journey will end. Right? Your journey of running around, seeking shelter, it will not rest until you come to your Lord. Meaning, you'll be running around seeking where to hide until you will realize there's no way to hide at all except with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ila rabbika yawma idhinil mustaqar. To your Allah, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your Lord is your return. يُنَبَّأُ الْإِنسَانُ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ بِمَا قَدَّمَ وَأَخَّرُ On that day, mankind will be told about what they have left behind for this dunya 
and what they have left for the Akhirah. Ya Ikhwati, ask yourself this question. What have you left for the, for the Akhirah? What have you left for the Akhirah? What have you left for the Akhirah? You know the mushkila is, we tend to love the dunya far more than the Akhirah. And I'll prove to you that you love the dunya more than the Akhirah. I'll prove it. And I'll prove it and you will agree with me. Wallahi, Abu Yusuf is right, Tawfiq is right. Let me give you this, this example. When a rich man comes to your house, okay? When a rich man comes to your house, you know, a tansri, you guys, you have tansri here? Or a dato comes to your house, very wealthy man. He rocks up in his Mercedes. He comes to your house, you made iftar for him, okay? And, he, and you made iftar for him, he comes to your house. What do you tell your families to cook? Do you tell your families to cook one dish or two dishes? Just nasi goreng or uh, nasi lemak? Or do you tell them to cook everything that you have? Get everything out. And when you see your wife has only cooked nasi goreng or nasi lemak, you get angry with him. What? You've only cooked this much? No, 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 no. It's a dato coming. You have to cook more than that. He is so wealthy. It's shame. You can't put that. Make chicken and beef and lamb and this and that. Cook everything. Correct? Yeah. Correct or not? It's true, right? When a rich man comes to your house, you cook a lot. Compare this to a poor beggar coming to your house. Compare this to a poor beggar coming to your house. What do you do? When a poor beggar comes to your house, what do you do? You get angry with your wife. Why did you cook more than two dishes? That's enough. The guy is poor. He, can't even, he doesn't even get that in his, in, his, in his home. Why are you cooking more than two dishes? What? You cook more than chicken? No, chicken is enough. Don't give him the full chicken. Give him half of the chicken. Subhanallah. This is the mushkila. And you know this is true. You know what I'm saying is true. Is it not so? Wallahi, it's true. Wallahi, it's true. I remember, Ya Akhuti, in Medina, when I was there, one of the Amir was coming to the house of one of the brothers. The man cooked 10 goats just for the Amir. And the Amir came in, all he did was eat a little bit of rice. That's it. Kalas. You know. All he did was eat a little bit of rice. Ten goats there was. For what? Why do we treat people like this? Why do we treat rich people better than poor people? Because we love wealth. And we love this dunya more than the akhirah. That's the mushkila. We love this dunya far more than the akhirah. Until you treat people. Not based upon their level of, level of their richness in this dunya. Until you start treating people. Upon the level of taqwa in this dunya and the akhirah. Taqwa, fear of Allah. Until you do that, your love for the Akhirah will not be complete. And this is not me saying this. This is Sufyan al-Thawri, the great Abid, the great scholar of Islam. He said, if you want to prove to yourself how much you love this dunya more than the Akhirah, ask yourself how much do you cook for the rich man compared to how much you cook for the poor man. So ask yourself this question, ya ikhwati. And wallahi, do not be a hypocrite. The biggest problem will be, that you will come on the day of judgment, you're expecting Allah to, to have open arms and to angels to say, Ahlan wa sahlan, marhaban, ilal jannah, here you go, jannah for you, oh, no, 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 go, 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 go. Is that what you're expecting? Subhanallah. You might have a shock of your life. And that is why when Imam al Tabari rahimahullah was passing away, when he was passing away, he recited the verse of the Quran, Wa bada lahum min Allahi ma lam yakunu yahtasibun. And there came upon them what they were not expecting from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning what? They were, you were expecting when you die, angels of mercy to come down, for you to be welcomed into Jannah, for your Lord to be say, Ahla wa sahlan, my slave, here you go, Firdaus al-A'la, here you go, and some Harulain waiting for you. Is that what you're expecting? But what could be the other way? It could be that the angels of punishment are waiting, and the 19 angels of Jahannam are waiting for you because you wasted your life in this dunya. And you thought you were a believer, but you weren't. You were a hypocrite. Yehuti, I pondered a lot about why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off Surah Baqarah, which is the earliest surah in the Quran. After Surah Fatiha, which is very small, little, only quarter of a page, right? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off straight away by, by Surah Baqarah. In Surah Baqarah, who is the first group of people Allah talks about? Who is the first group of people? Very early on, Allah talks about who? وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَبِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ Who is that? Munafiqun. So why does the Qur'an start off with Munafiqun? Describing and talking about Munafiqun very early on in the Qur'an. What was the hikmah in this? 
it became clear to me after a, after a long time of pondering that today we are an ummah full of munafiqeen. We are an ummah full of munafiqeen. We say that we, we, we say la ilaha illallah but we have no la ilaha illallah in our hearts. We say la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah but where is the Islam in our, in our lives? Where is the Islam in our actions? Where is the Islam in our judgments? Where is the Islam in our living? We are an ummah full of munafiqeen wallahi. We say with our tongue that which we do not practice with our actions. And that is why the Quran focuses very early on about nifaq. So ya khwati, beware of this. Beware of the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the great scholars of Islam, uh, 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 one of the great salaf al-salih, one of the great students of the sahaba, uh, he reported, uh, Abdullah bin al-Hakam, he said that I met 10 of the Ashara Mubashireen, all of the 10 Sahaba who were promised Jannah. You know those 10 that were promised Jannah? Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, anhu, all those 10 that were promised Jannah. I met each one of them. And then guess what he said? He said each one of them was afraid that he was a Munafiq. Each one of them was afraid that he was a Munafiq. In one authentic narration, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu went to Hudayfa. And we know Hudayfa was the one who Rasulullah had told him the names of all the Munafiqeen. He said, Ya Hudayfa, as'aluka billah. I ask you by Allah, did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi mention my name to you? That I was a munafiq? I ask you by Allah, did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi say that I was a munafiq? Tell me now. Subhanallah. Ya ikhwati, you can't be a righteous man until you consider yourself a munafiq. If you don't consider yourself a munafiq, you might be a munafiq. Because, because the best of us were always afraid of being munafiqeen. That we say with our tongues that which, that which we do not do with our, with our, with our actions. Ya salam. Let's change ourselves. Change ourselves totally, equity. Lest this Quran be a hujja upon us, not a hujja for us. Balil insanu ala nafsihi basira. Balil insanu ala nafsihi basira. Walau alqa ma'adhira. Rather, mankind is ever a witness over himself. Even if he were to give a thousand excuses. Ya akhi, if one of you were to misbehave and I asked you, akhi, why did you do that? Straight away, excuses will come to your mind. Yeah, I remember at work, when I, when I work, I have, mashallah, I have a lot of people that work with us in Mercy Mission. Over 3,000 people work with us in Mercy Mission now, mashallah. And when I ask one of the brothers, brothers, why was that thing not done? The first thing is excuses that come to people's minds. It's very easy to give excuses. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, even if you can think of excuses, you yourself know whether you are right or wrong. You yourself know, despite your ability to argue, and despite your ability to give excuses, you yourself know whether you're right or wrong. So you don't need Allah to give you your book of deeds on the day of judgment. You don't need the angels to tell you. You don't need Allah to tell you. You know yourself in your heart whether you're right or wrong. And that is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said in authentic hadith in Bukhari. He said, Al-Ithm mahala fi nafsik wa karihta an yattala alayha al-nas. Al-Ithm. What is Ithm? What is the sin? Describe and define a sin to me. The Prophet said, sin is whatever hala fi nafsik. Meaning, you have difficulty accepting in your heart. You know it in your heart, it's wrong. Al-Ithm mahala fi nafsik. And you hate that people find out about it. So ask yourself, how many sins are you doing? Because you know how many things you have difficulty in your heart accepting and how many things you hate other people would find out about you. And that is the number of sins that we have, ya khuti. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Please don't let this ayah be a hujja upon us. Let this be a reminder that every single night before going to sleep, you take yourself to account. Ask yourself, what did you do today that was good? And ask Allah to accept it and forgive you for any deficiencies in it. And ask yourself, what is it that you did wrong? And who did you wrong? And make up your mind to fix it tomorrow. Make up your mind to fix it straight away. Ya ikhwati, we are not angels. We were not created to be angels. We were created to sin. Jannah was not created for perfect human beings. Jannah was created for sinners who repent. 
was not created for perfect human beings because there is no such thing other than Rasulullah. Jannah was created for human beings that repent, ya khwati, who sin and repent, sin and repent. And the critical thing about repentance is regret. The Prophet said, Anadam huwa tawbah. Regret is repentance. Regret is repentance. How will you regret if you don't account yourself? If you don't self account, you will never regret. So it's important to take yourself to self account. Look at your sins written down on a piece of paper and regret over what you have done today. And have that regret, ya khuti. It will make you a better person, inshallah. Tayyip. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves on to tell the Prophet ﷺ to not be musta'ajil, to not be hurry. Because remember the second reason after the first reason of accountability, lack of accountability, is number two is what? Is that we are in a hurry all the time. So Allah tells Rasulullah to not be in a hurry. To give you an example how even the best of us fall into the mistake of being in too much hurry. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا تحرك به لسانك لتعجلبه. So do not be in a hurry to recite this Qur'an لتعجلبه, in order to recite the Qur'an very quickly. So ikhwati, the scholars of tafsir understood this verse to mean that the Prophet وسلم, as soon as Jibreel would come down, I would recite, right? As soon as Jibreel would recite, the Prophet would recite right after him, very quickly. La uqsimu bi yawmil qiyamah. Straight away, as soon as Jibreel is saying, La uqsimu bi yawmil qiyamah, straight away Rasulullah would also be saying, La uqsimu bi yawmil qiyamah, wa la uqsimu, wa la uqsimu, bi nafsi la uwa, bi nafsi la uwa. You know, straight away he would want to recite. And that is why the scholars of Tafsir say it is disliked. Some even say it's haram for you to recite with the Quran when the Shaykh is reciting. Or for you to recite with the radio. You know when you put the radio on and you want to start reciting like Sudais or you want to start reciting like Mahar al muaiqili or some other Shaykh, you put it on and you start reciting with them as well. Or Mishari Rashid Al-Fasi or someone like that, you put it on and you start reciting with them. It's makruh, it's dislike to do so. What should you do? وَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنُ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَأَنْسِتُوا لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ When the Qur'an is recited, keep quiet and listen. So the right way of doing so is let one verse play, then stop it, then recite after him. Then let the next verse play, then recite after him. Then let the next verse play, then recite after him. Does that make sense, Ya Khwati? Right. So it's very, very important we do this. Very important, Ya Khwati, that we do this. That we don't try and recite right with the radio recorder or put a microphone in our ears on a walkman and recite, you know, Surah Juz Amma, whatever, and try to recite with it. No, listen to it, then recite after it. Okay? طيب. Because Allah says, لا تحرك به لسانك. Because Allah wants you to listen to the words. When you're not listening to the words, that's when Allah gets angry. So, لا تحرك به لسانك. Do not hurry up by moving your tongue with this, with this Quran. لِتَعْجَلَ بِهِ In order to hurry up memorizing it. إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا جَمْعَهُ وَقُرْآنَ It is upon us to jam'ahu, to gather it, وَقُرْآنَ And to recite it to you. Meaning, it is my responsibility of Muhammad Wasallam. I have taken this upon myself to ensure that I gather the Qur'an in your heart and to make you memorize it upon your tongue. Okay? I will ensure that this will be in your heart. So don't be in a hurry. The Prophet would, would be in a hurry because he'd be afraid that Jibreel will go back and then he might make a mistake in an ayah. Okay? So that's why he was in a hurry. However, Allah said, It is my responsibility to jam'ahu, to gather it in your heart, wa qur'ana, and to recite it upon your tongue. Okay? So don't be in a hurry. Fa'idha qara'nahu. So when we recite it, by we, what do you mean by we? Meaning Jibreel, I and my angels. When we recite it to you, fa'idha qara'nahu. فَاتَّبِعْ قُرْآنَ Meaning keep quiet and listen to its recitation. Okay? Keep quiet and listen to the recitation. Don't be in a hurry to repeat it right after. And that's what we should do as well. When we are listening, we listen and then we recite after it. Don't be in a hurry to recite. Do you know what happens if we do that? If we recite after the Shaykh is reciting, we have our own melody. What ends up happening is when you try and recite with the Shaykh, is you end up reciting with the Shaykh's melody. And that's why the scholars of Tafsir say it's makruh. It's disliked, very heavily disliked that you recite with the recitation of someone else. So, you know, there might be some budding Sudaises over here, or some budding Mahar Mu'aykhlis in our audience over here. It's because you like to recite like them. 
there's no need to Allah will teach you the Quran on your own you will have your own beautiful way of reciting it you don't have to imitate anyone else imitating another speaker or another reciter is disliked very heavily disliked in Islam okay so this imitation that I know some people have unfortunately become very popular on the internet because they can recite with the 10 recitations of 10 different reciters this is not right in fact I know that these people when they pray behind other brothers and sisters who are reciting the Quran they can't even correct them because they might be reciting with a different melody they can't even correct them at that point also you tend to be so focused on the way your reciter recites that if he coughs somewhere you cough as well and if he cries somewhere you cry as well isn't that true it's true there see all those guys are laughing over there because I think it's true because it's true isn't it is it true or not guys it's true isn't it that's right it happens and if a sheikh recites the verse twice you tend to recite it twice as well because you can't you can't go on to the next verse because you forget what the melody how the melody goes musibah yeah this is not the way you should be reciting this is not the way you should be reciting okay so listen to what Allah said believe me Allah will teach you every one of you have beautiful voices Allah will give you the most amazing recitation of the Quran you don't have to imitate anybody you will have your own way of reciting the Quran bi'ithnillah inshallah so when we recite it, listen to it. Do not be in a hurry to recite with it. Then it is upon us to bayana. What is bayana? To explain it to you. So therefore, recitation is one thing. The words are one thing. And the tafsir is a second. Bayan is tafsir, right guys? So this is what Allah is saying. Allah is saying, first I will make sure you memorize the words. And of course he would memorize the words with a meaning because each word has a meaning. But the real tafsir of it is something else. Because Allah says, Thumma inna alayna bayana is I will explain it to you. And that is why my brothers and sisters in Islam, my sincere advice to you is to take the tafsir of the Quran. Do not learn something except that you take the tafsir. The Sahaba would not go past 10 verses when they memorized 10 verses until they learned the tafsir of it and implemented it. How long did it take for Imam Ahmed rahimahullah to memorize Surah Baqarah? Imam Ahmed said, I took, I took no less than five years to memorize Surah Baqarah. Imam Ahmed took five years to memorize Surah Baqarah? Five years? Absolutely, five years. Why? Not because he's not giving time, it's because when he took a verse, he implemented it and he learned about it and he learned the tafsir of it, all the hadith, hadith behind it, all the prohibitions he stayed away from, all the obligations he did it, then he moved on. Does that make sense, Yaqwati? Right. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, how long did Umar take to, to, to memorize Surah Baqarah? It was reported in the authentic narrations in the seer of, of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu that he took eight years to memorize Surah Baqarah. Eight years to memorize Surah Baqarah. Allahu Akbar. Why does it take so long? Because your equity, their memorization and our memorization are the difference between the heavens and the earth. We memorize just with the words. They memorize with the meaning and the action. Because the Quran has no more benefit unless you act upon, this, upon these words. Tayyip. Thumma inna alayna bayana. Then upon us is to explain it to you. Kalla bal al ajila. So the second reason Allah moves on to. What is the second reason we disbelieve in Day of Judgment? Kalla, rather nay, tuhibbun al-ajila. You love to be in a hurry. You love to be always in a hurry. Wa tadharoon al-akhira. Ya'ikhwati, we're in a hurry all the time. Good or bad, right? But unfortunately, those things that we should be in a hurry to do, we're not in a hurry to do anymore. The Prophet ﷺ said, to be in a hurry is from the shaitan, except in three things. What are those three things? Hadith is authentic. What are those three things? Number one is to do good deeds. Number two is to bury the dead. Number three is to get the young ones married. Get the young ones married. Today, we take our time with everything, including doing good deeds. We're not in a hurry. How many of us, with all due respect, hurried to pay our zakat? Straight away at the beginning of Ramadan came. Vast majority haven't. And I know this because I run Mercy Mission. I run the National Zakat Foundation Mercy Mission. And we know that all the zakat that comes in the first 20 days, right, is only one third. 
what comes in the last 10 days is two thirds of the zakat that is due from people. Two thirds come in the last 10 days. Why? Because we're not in a hurry to do good. Subhanallah, we're not in a hurry to do good. طيب. We should be in a hurry to do good. What about burying the dead? How long does it take for us to bury the dead? Today, it takes us far too long. The Prophet ﷺ died and he was buried with by, before the next salah. He was buried before the next salah came. Amazing, isn't it? Died around Dhuhr, he was buried by Asr. Allahu Akbar. He was buried. And Yahuti, we know that, of course, uh, uh, the only thing that delayed the burial of the Prophet ﷺ was that the Sahaba, they disagreed and they differed as to what they were going to do and who was going to be the Khalifa thereafter. But what we know from authentic narrations is that they decided to leave their debate until the Prophet was buried, okay? So, ala kulli hal, whatever it is, the point is, even when Abu Bakr died, he, he died at Maghrib, he was buried by Isha. Okay? So, hurrying to bury the people is from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And lastly, of course, to get the young ones married. Today, we don't hurry to marry the young ones off. And this is a big mushkila. This is a mushkila. We don't hurry to, mar to, bury the young, to, to, to marry the young ones. Okay? And this is a mushkila. I know some brothers are laughing here. So I wish my mom heard this, right? I wish my dad heard this. Miskeen, I swear. Miskeen. Come on, guys. You're miskeen, man. Just get married. Allahumma stan. So, ala kulli hal, it's true. Today we want degrees and PhDs. Musiba. What is the average age of getting married today? 26, 27, 35, PhD, masters. What's the use? Musiba. It is because subhanAllah your kids are growing up with an even bigger age gap between you and you and your kids. You're like a grandpa now. Like you know, grandfathers are having kids now. <laughs> Subhanallah, there is a beauty in getting married early and that beauty is that you protect yourself from evil deeds early on. Ya ikhwati, the hadith of Rasulullah states that anyone who looks at a woman, anyone who looks at a woman who is not halal for him, Allah will pour molten lead on his eyes on the day of judgment. So I don't know about you, but you protect yourselves. Brothers, protect yourselves. Protect yourselves. It's important that you get married early on. Do not delay your marriage. And fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this matter. Tayyip. Kalla bal tuhibbun al ajila. Rather, you love to be in a hurry. Wa tadharun al akhira. And you leave aside the day of judgment. Wujuhu yawma idin nadira. On that day, faces will be bright and shining. Nadira means nadra. Nadra means light and, 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 and brightness on their faces. Wujuhu yawma idin nadira. Some faces will be bright on that day. Ila rabbiha nadira. Allahu akbar. Allahu akbar. They will be looking at their Lord. That's why their faces will be bright. Because they'll be able to see Allah. Ya ikhwati, the greatest tragedy of entering Jahannam is that you'll never be able to see Allah. The greatest tragedy of dying as a disbeliever is that you'll never be able to see Allah. What a distress, what a tragedy that would be to not be able to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How amazing it would be to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. The same God that we worship, the same God who we die for we struggle for. Let's not give this up. And remember, each hour of good deeds in this dunya equals to one hour of seeing Allah on the Day of Judgment. Why would you give it up? Why would you give up your good deeds in this dunya? Why would you belittle your good deeds? Why would you say, oh, this class, I have something better to do. I'm going to go and prepare for food or whatever else. Why would you give up this one hour of being with Allah and seeing Allah on the Day of Judgment? Wouldn't you give it up? Subhanallah. So never ever belittle your good. Each hour of good in this dunya equals an hour of good in the akhirah. And seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the akhirah. Ila rabbiha nadira. The scholars of Islam say there are more than 100 authentic hadith. More than 100 authentic hadith that the believers will be able to see Allah on the day of judgment. More than 100 authentic hadith. And that is why the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah al-Jama'ah, they say, that the scholars Ahlul Sunnah and Jama'ah have complete ijma' and consensus that you will be able to see Allah In one authentic hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, in Bukhari, he said, you'll be able to see Allah just like you're able to see the moon on a full moon night. Meaning, not that Allah will look like the moon, no, billah, but that Allah, just like you're able to see the moon very easily, in the same way, 
you'll be able to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the sky very easily as well. Tayyip. Ila Rabbiha Nadira, looking at their Lord. Wa wujuhu yawma idin basira. And on that day, some faces will be basir. Basira comes from the word basar. What does it mean? Basra. What does it mean? It means distorted. Like imagine someone who has burnt up his face. You know, like someone who has burned injury on his face and then his face heals back. Have you seen how his eyes are distorted and his face is distorted? Right. So Allah says some faces will be distorted. Basira, meaning they've been burnt and they have been tortured so much that the eyes are here. The other eyes here. The nose is smashed this way completely. The jaws are falling off. Their faces are completely distorted. Why? Because of the fear. It fears. Those human beings are afraid that the faqira will be done to them. What does faqira mean? What does it mean? Faqira comes from the meaning of the faqir of the or the faqar of the back. So you know the vertebra of the back? What are they called in Arabic? Faqira, right? The vertebra of the back are called the faqira, okay? These are the vertebra of the back. So faqira means something that breaks the back. Okay? So what breaks the back? So imagine like for example, you know, you know how one of the ways to hit somebody and kill somebody is to stab them in the back and also to grab them and then kick them in the back, right? Something that breaks the back or for example, throwing the person off from the high ground to a low ground until his back breaks. So this is called faqira. Means these human beings, some faces will be happy, others will be distorted. Why? Because they're afraid that their backs are just about to be broken. Allah is going to punish them in, so, in such a way, the angels are going to kick them and hit them in such a way that it's going to break the bones of their back and smash and completely fracture their back. Yes, salam. Yes, salam. تَذُنُّ أَنْ يُفْعَلَ بِهَا فَاقِرَ كَلَّا Rather nay. The third reason why people disbelieve, the third and the last reason why people disbelieve the Day of Judgment is what? Death, isn't it? We've forgotten death. Look at the description of death here. Yes, salam. Yes, salam. It is so powerful. It is so powerful. Only Allah can reveal these words. Not a human being could ever spoke, have spoken like this. Kalla idha balagati taraqi. Rather, nay, when the soul has reached the taraqi. What is taraqi? Taraqi are the collarbones. Okay? The collarbones up here. Okay? This is called taraqi. When the soul has reached the taraqi. Okay? So it's gone beyond the taraqi, gone beyond the collarbones, and reached the, reached the throat. Because we know that the souls will come out of the mouth. Right? So it's about to come out. So the soul is up here. Kalla idha balagati taraqi. Waqila man And it is said. Okay, meaning imagine has anyone seen the moment of death perhaps in a movie or perhaps someone passing away? Okay, the last breath is coming. What happens then? Someone quickly presses the red button on the wall. All the alarms and sirens go off. Help, help, someone save my father, he's dying. Help, help, nurse, doctor, someone. Straight away, I get the beep. As a doctor, I get the beeper. Beep, 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 beep. This is the blue, blue code pager. Okay, patient so-and-so, on level so-and-so is passing away. I have literally two minutes to run. So I start running. I leave everything aside. I'm suturing this patient. No problem. I leave him aside. I have to run and save this. I've got literally five minutes to save his brain. Or he will die. Okay, takes me two or three minutes to run to him. He's somewhere else in the other part of the hospital. I'm running to him. Everyone's running. And it is said, who will save him? Who will save him? And the soul knows that he is about to die. The human being knows he's about to die. The ikhwati, how many times is a doctor successful in saving a patient who has, whose heart stops? How many percentages? Does anyone know? Only 5%. 5% success rate. Of CPR. You know what CPR is? The chest compressions, the electric shocks. You think, mashallah, we can revive things, right? That's what you all think. Reality is 5%. We're not successful. When, when it, the time is to come, that's it. Halas, gone, you're gone. You, nothing is going to save you. No doctor, no hospital, nothing is going to save you. 5%.
And in equity, I want to tell you something. It's very, very important. Before everyone thinks we're going to get a chance to say La ilaha illallah at the time of our death, let me tell you something. The vast majority of us will not get a chance to say La ilaha illallah. Why? This is a medical doctor telling you this. Why? Let me tell you. We are all Asians. We are of a particular ethnicity. We have certain disease profile in our, in our disease spectrum. We will die. The vast majority of us will die from what? Well, majority of us will die from heart failure and diabetes, okay, which will cause heart failure or renal failure. How many of us will die of that? On average, 33% of us will die from heart failure. Okay, that's, I'd say this much. All of you, all of that, heart failure. Audhu billah, musibah. Okay, and then one-fourth of us will die from cancer. One-fourth of us will die from cancer, which is, huh, this bit over here from cancer. I know I'm making, making it a little bit uh, laughter, but believe me, heart failure, okay, which is a heart attack and heart going bad, whatever else, and then about one-fourth of 25%. So what's 25 plus 33? How much is that? 25 plus 33 is 58%, right? So 58% will die from either cancer or heart failure or uh, heart-related conditions, okay? And then there's about 10 or 15% will die from uh, uh, sudden death. Sudden death includes things like uh, car accidents, uh, falling off a cliff, uh, uh, yani, you know, uh, accidents at work. 10 to 15% die because of that, okay? So and this is because Muslim countries, we have very bad transport, we have very bad safety in our cars. Uh, and if you just see some of these guys, how they drive their motorbikes, Audhu Billah. Man, the motorbikes are asking for it, you know, you know, you know, they're going inside the cars. This is asking for death, man. Subhanallah, it's true. Because they just have a lot of, lot of crashes. I don't think there's a single motorbike, motorbike rider here, except you might have crashed once in a while. Because subhanallah, it's so, so common. Motorbikes is about 20-25% uh, 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 death rate of riding motorbikes. It's one of the things that you should not do. So, ikhwati, therefore, about 65% of the people here will have a death which we will not have a chance. Right. About 60, 60, 65 or 66 percent of the people here will have a death which we will not have a chance to say La ilaha illallah. Why? Because the people who are in heart failure, the way you will die is usually in your, in your bed, gasping from air because lungs have filled up with water and you cannot breathe anymore. You cannot even you will not even have the ability to even get a breath to say La ilaha illallah. I, I assure you, this is the way it is. Or sudden death, because your heart will suddenly give out. Or because you'll be put into big machines. When you come to hospital, your heart's failing. You'll be put into big machines to keep you alive, and you will not even have the ability to say La ilaha illallah, because as soon as the machine's put off, you die. Cancer. Vast majority of people who die from cancer, how will they die? Well, today, if you go to the cancer ward, you will die because of the, of the drugs we give you, because the pain you'll be in. The pain is so bad, the pain is so bad when it goes to the back of the bones or goes to another part of the liver or goes to the brains or wherever else the cancer is spread. The pain is so bad, wallahi, that we give you so much morphine and so much midazolam and so much other drugs to keep you, uh, you know, less pain, but it keeps you almost drugged out. You know, you're drugged out. That's it. In that way, you will die. Where is the chance to say La ilaha illallah? Where is your chance to say La ilaha illallah? I, would, I, I want to know, for vast majority of my patients have no chance to say La ilaha illallah. There's no time. So ikhwati, if this is what you're, you're hoping for, no, no, inshallah, tawfiq, don't worry, I'll get the chance to say La ilaha illallah, I'll, you know, I'll be ready for it. Because as soon as we say La ilaha illallah, we'll go to, we'll go to Jannah. That's, not, that's, that's, a, that's a figment of your imagination. Vast majority of people will never get the chance to do it. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, be afraid of your death. The Prophet ﷺ said, if you knew what I knew, then you would laugh less and you would cry more. You would laugh less and you would cry more. Also in one authentic hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, if you knew what I know, then you would not find pleasure in sleeping with your wives. He said in one authentic hadith in Bukhari, he said, if you knew what I know, you would not bury your dead. You would not bury your dead. Because of the punishment of the grave. The ikhwati is very, very difficult. 
the Prophet وسلم, at the time of his death, he was dipping his hands in the water and wiping his face. Dipping his hands in the water, wiping his face. And he was saying, La ilaha illallah, authentic hadith in Abu Dawood. He said, and Tirmidhi and others. He said, What? La ilaha illallah, inna lil mawti la ghamarat, wa inna lil mawti la sakarat. Verily, death has its trials. Verily, death has its pain. Death is not easy, ya Please stop thinking you're going to have an easy death. Oh, I know my uncle, mashallah, what a beautiful, peaceful death he had. Who are you fooling? What the heck do you know? Only Allah knows what sort of tragedy and difficulty people have at the time of death. And that is why truly death is a musibah. Death is a musibah. Musibah for you, musibah for your family. And the reality is there's no one amongst us except that we are, we are headed for it. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا جَعَلْنَا لِبَشَرٍ مِّنْ قَبْلِكَ الْخُلْدِ أَفَإِنْ مِتَّ فَهُمُ الْخَالِدُونَ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ he said, Wallahi, we have not given any bashar, any human being, before you, O Muhammad Sallallahu eternal life. Afa in mitta. So if you are to die, do they think they will live forever? Kullu nafsin da'iqatul maut. Every single soul will taste death. My brothers and sisters in Islam, I urge you, I urge you very strongly, do not forget death. Do not forget death. Remind yourself of death every day and you will be of those people who remember the day of judgment all the time. Forget death and you will forget Allah's haq upon you. Forget death and you will be engrossed in sins. But remember death and you will be of the best of people on this earth. Once the Prophet ﷺ was walking and he was on his riding beast, horse, and he came across a grave and the horse was nearly about to throw him off. He was nearly about to throw him off. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya ikhwani limithli hadha fasta'iddu. He said, what? He said, oh, my brothers in Islam, for the example of this, of, of this, prepare yourselves. In one authentic narration, the Prophet ﷺ came out of his house, authentic hadith in Bukhari, and his eyes was, was red crying. His eyes was red, just like we get when we cry. And not just once we just get red, but when he was crying so much, his eyes became so red, watery red. He said, Ya Rasulullah, what happened? What happened, Ya Rasulullah? He said, Wallahi, if you knew what I know about, about the punishment of the grave, you would cry more and would laugh less. Meaning, Allah had revealed to him at that point the different types of punishment in the grave, and so he was crying. And you know about the punishment of the grave. A person who forgets the Quran, the Prophet ﷺ told us what the punishment is. In authentic hadith in Bukhari, he told us five different punishments of the grave. One of them was, Rasulullah Jibreel and Mikail came and took him by the hand and the first person he came to was a person who was on the ground and an angel had pinned him to the ground with his leg an angel had put his neck leg on his neck pinning him down and took a a you know those things that we use to open up the the wheels a machete he had taken a machete and he was tearing his mouth from this side putting it inside his mouth and tearing it and then putting it inside here, tearing it and tearing his neck up. And then every time he would stop, the man would be screaming in pain. And then Allah would put his face back again. Again, he would go again and continue on. The Prophet said, who is this? Jibreel and Mikail said, this is a person who spread lies and tales in this dunya. Another person he came to, the next person, the angel, angels were pinning him down. Another angel took a big boulder, like a mountain, and was smashing his head with it. Who is this person? Ya Salam, who is this person? Smashing his head with a mountain. Who is this person? He is a person who read the Quran, but he, but he forgot it. He memorized some parts of the Quran, but then he forgot it. Don't you dare forget the Quran. Don't you dare memorize parts of the Quran, then you forget it. Don't you dare. Don't you dare forget Allah's words. This is far too serious. Another person was a person who was swimming in blood. And every time he'd be trying to get out of the blood from the banks of the river, of this river of blood, this angel would throw a stone at his face, it would hit his face and would push him all the way to the middle of the river. And he'd be drowning and eating his vomit and, and the blood. Who is this person? Ya Salam, who is this person? This is the person who took riba in this dunya. And you think you might not be taking riba, but I guarantee you, there's no one on this masjid here, even myself, except that we've been touched by riba. No one here except we've been touched by riba. Let me give you an example of how we've been touched by riba. 
Is there anyone here except that we paid late fees? Have we paid late fees for a bill that we were late on? Yes or no? Have you paid late fees? So what is late fees except riba? What is late fees? What is riba? Riba is, give me more time. Give me more time, I'll give you more money. That's what it is. So late fee means, give me more, more time to pay the principal as long as you pay a fee for it. Late fees are essentially riba. So if every one of us has paid late fee once in their life, that means we've, we've been involved in riba. And the Prophet said, the one who gives it, the one who signs it, and the one who takes it are all equal in the sin. Are all equal in the sin of riba. Subhanallah. Look at this fourth, fourth punishment of the grave. The Prophet came upon these people. They were naked. They were being burnt in a fire, in an oven. And every time the fire would come, it would burn their bodies. And they were trying to get out of the oven. And the fire would burn them. Who is these people? These are the people who committed zina in this dunya. And if you think you haven't committed zina because, mashallah, you haven't really committed zina, well, let me tell you this hadith. The Prophet said, there is no children of Adam except that Allah has written a nisbah of zina for him. There is no children of Adam except that a nisbah of zina has been written for him. What do you mean? Zina of the eyes, or zina of the hands, or zina of the hearts, zina of the legs. There is no one amongst us except that we have committed some zina or the other. It may, may not be the total zina which is actually sleeping with a woman that's not allowed for you. But is there anyone amongst us who is safe from thinking about illicit, illicit relationship with a person who is not halal for us? A'udhu Billah. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, protect yourselves. Protect yourselves from the punishment of the grave. Look at what Allah says. وَظَنَّ أَنَّهُ الْفِرَاقِ and the soul knows that is the moment of his death. What does that mean? And the shin has been intertwined with the shin. What is the shin? Your legs are intertwined with the legs. What is Allah referring to here? This is a crushing of the grave. Who will save the soul? And the soul knows it is dead, it is dying. Meaning when the body has been put into the grave, the grave crushes. In the authentic hadith in Tabarani, it is reported that the Prophet ﷺ said, There is no human being who enters the grave except the grave will crush him until his ribs intertwine and his legs intertwine. Like this. Your legs will intertwine and your ribs will intertwine from the crushing of the grave. This is what our Prophet has promised us. Ya ikhwati, save yourselves. Save yourselves. Nothing will save you from the punishment of the grave except having a good relationship with Allah, being firm on your deen, keeping up your Qur'an. This is not a joke or a mockery. If the people who have passed away could tell us only, they would tell us tales of what has happened to them. So be wary and save yourselves from this punishment. And when the shin has been attached to the shin, On that day is the return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why all of this punishment? فَلَا صَدَّقَ وَلَا صَلَّى He never gave charity, nor did he pray. That's why. So save yourselves by praying and keeping up your salah. And give charity every day. Every day you must give charity. Every day. Every day you must give charity. Please, ya ikhwati, every day give charity. One ring it, two ring it. Every day give charity. فَلَا صَدَّقَ Allah starts with صَدَّقَ he never gave charity, nor did he pray. So he starts off with charity, giving charity as the first most important thing that saves a person from the punishment of Allah. Sadaqa. Okay? Fala sadaqa, wala salla, nor did he pray. Walakin kathaba wa tawalla. Rather, he lied and he turned away. Thumma dhahaba ila ahlihi yatamakta. Then he went to his family and he had a great time. He just went to his family and he played around and he had a great time enjoying with his family. Awla laka fa awla. Woe to you, O human beings, or woe to you. Thumma awla laka fa awla. Thumma woe to you. Thumma woe to you. Thereafter, woe to you, woe to you again. Ayahsabul insanu ayyutraka suda. Does mankind think that they will be left alone? Allahu Akbar. Do we think Allah will just leave us alone? We can just do that here. Leave me alone. No, you won't be left alone. Does mankind think we'll be left alone? Alam yaku yumna. Was he not a nutfa, a small uh, piece of uh, uh, 
this, this clotted uh, fluid that flows from the body, was he not the nutfa that came out, the clotted blood, blood that formed from this money, the semen that came out of his father? Was he not this clot, clot of blood, insignificant nothing, which your mother could have had a miscarriage, you'd not even have realized that the, the egg has gone away? Subhanallah. What was he? What were we? We were nothing but this clot of blood. Alam yumna, thumma kana alaqatan. Then was he not a clot of blood? Thumma fasawa. Then he clothed it and then he put flesh on it. Faja'ala minhu zawjaini dhakara wal untha. And he made from it a human being, a male and a female. Alaysa dhalik. Is not he who is able to do this? Bi qadirin, able to. Ayyuhiya al mawta. To give life to the death. Is he who is able to do this, not able to give life to the dead? My brothers and my sisters in Islam, this is Surah Qiyamah. Very, very powerful Surah. Small Surah, but so powerful. The Prophet used to love to recite this in Fajr. He used to love to recite this before going to bed. Because, ya akhwati, when you recite this on your own, before you go to bed, you have this profound feeling of the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you. And your heart is filled with repentance. Ya akhwati, Fill yourself with the remembrance of death. Do not be of those people who are hasty and be of those people who take self-account. And inshallah, you will become a very, very different person on this dunya. Let me read in Arabic, inshallah. Listen to it now that you know the meaning of it and feel the power of this, uh, inshallah, as, it, as you understand it now. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. La uqsimu bi yawmil qiyamah. ولا أقسم بالنفس اللوامة أيحسب الإنسان أن لن نجمع عظامة بلا قادرين على أن نسوي بنانة بل يريد الإنسان ليفجر أمامة يسأل أيان يوم القيامة فإذا برق البصر وخسف القمر وجمع الشمس والقمر يقول الإنسان يومئذ أين المفر كلا لا وزر إلى ربك يومئذ المستقر ينبأ الإنسان يومئذ بما قدم وأخر بل الإنسان على نفسه بصيرة ولو ألقى معاذيرة لا تحرك به لسانك لتعجل به إن علينا جمعه وقرآنه فإذا قرأناه فاتبع قرآنه ثم إن علينا بيانه كلا بل تحبون العاجلة وتذرون الآخرة وجوه يومئذ ناظرة إلى ربها ناظرة ووجوه يومئذ باصرة تظن أن يفعل بها فاقرة كلا إذا بلغت التراقي وقيل من راق وظن أنه الفراق والتفت الساق بالساق إلى ربك يومئذ المساق فلا صدق ولا صلى ولكن كذب وتولى ثم ذهب إلى أهله يتمطى أولى لك فأولى ثم أولى لك فأولى أيحسب الإنسان أن يترك سدى ألم يكن طفة من من يمنى ثم كان علقة فخلق فسوى فجعل منه الزوجين الذكر والأنثى 
أليس ذلك بقادر على أن يحيي الموتى جزاكم الله خير Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those people who believe in the day of judgment with our words and our hearts and with our actions and make us of those people who are not the people who have anything but a very happy face on the day of judgment looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and successful ikhwati, This is the conclusion of our tafsir for this week inshallah to have two more surahs left only uh, the last the next surah is called surah insan it is all about uh, about Jannah. It is all about the beautiful description of Jannah. Very beautiful. Uh, is that on, on Friday? Is that correct? Are you sure? Friday. Okay. All right. Uh, so Qutayba uh, is telling me it will be on Friday, inshallah, in this masjid. Be in the love, 5.15 p.m. sharp. Please don't miss it. It is one of the most detailed description of Jannah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given in the Quran. Very beautiful. Allah will talk about the servants of Jannah. He will talk about our houses, the rivers, the drinks, the clothes, the crystals, the rocks, the and the amazing wallahi. And all of this because uh, because of the actions of uh, Fatima and Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhum. The surah was revealed because of them, inshallah. And I will tell you all about it. Very beautiful. Don't miss it. Uh, and inshallah, when you, read, when you read that surah, you're full of love of Allah Zawajal. So if you're full of fear today, then learn about the love of Allah Zawajal that He has prepared for us all in Jannah, inshallah, so that we struggle to achieve it, inshallah. That is Surah Qiyamah, a Surah Insan. Be in Allah on Friday, 5.15 p.m. sharp. Tell people not to miss it. Only two more surahs left. Be in Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me and you the ability to attend it and listen to it, inshallah. Zakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh, 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 oh.